All right, welcome. This is lecture one from Ralston Valley High School's AP Chemistry Lecture Series. This is chapter 15, lecture number one on the common ion effect. Let's go ahead and get started. The topic which we're going to be introducing today is a concept which is related to equilibrium chemistry, in particular to Le Chatelier's principle. Uh, this is what we refer to as the common ion effect. By our definition here, the common ion effect is a shift in equilibrium that's going to occur upon the addition of an ion in the system which is already involved in the equilibrium reaction. Another way of imagining this is if there is an ion which is present in two different equilibria which simultaneously exist within your system, a change in the concentration of that ion due to one of the equilibria might affect, therefore, the equilibrium of the other system present. So with that kind of as a starting point here, let's take a look at an example problem and you'll see how um, this is going to work in terms of an application of Le Chatelier's principle. So have a look here for me at example number one. Suppose that we were to give you a weak acid with the generic formula HA that exists in a solution and the disassociation of that acid is described by the equation which is written below here, in which the species HA in aqueous solution is separating apart to form the hydrogen cation and the A negative anion, that is the conjugate base of that acid. So we've given you an equation here describing the disassociation of the acid. The question we're going to ask is this. Um, if we consider according to Le Chatelier's principle, um, in what direction will the equilibrium shift if we were to add hydrochloric acid to the solution itself? And as a follow-up question to that, what about if we were to add the salt NaA, where again A represents the A negative anion from that equilibrium? So with that as a starting point here, let's kind of consider what happens with the first situation in which we add the hydrochloric acid to our system. Recall from our previous conversations, you're familiar with the idea that hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. And as a strong acid, that implies, therefore, it will completely dissociate into solution into the component ions, that is the H positive cation, and the A negative anion. So I've written an equation here showing that dissociation. Now, comparing the two equations which we see here written for us, we have the disassociation of the weak acid HA, and then the dissociation of the strong acid HCl. Notice that there is, in fact, a ion which is in common to both of those dissociation equations. That is the hydrogen cation H positive. Now, we know by our definition of strong acids that they completely dissociate into solution, which implies as we add the hydrochloric acid to the solution, the concentration of hydrogen ion present in that solution would therefore go up. And once we determine that that concentration is to increase, by Le Chatelier's principle, an increase in the concentration of hydrogen ion should increase the rate at which that hydrogen cation collides with A-negative anions within the solution, thereby increasing the rate of the reverse reaction written in the weak acid HA's equilibrium. And if we increase the rate of that reverse reaction, the net effect of that should be, by Le Chatelier's principle, a shift in equilibrium to the left. So as we add that acid, we can expect an equilibrium shift left, which would imply, therefore, we would see more of the molecular acid HA present in our system. Now, the same effect would occur upon the addition of the salt NaA. Uh, recall, all alkali metal salts are soluble, and as such, were we to add the salt NaA into our solution, it would completely dissociate into solution as sodium ions Na positive, and the A negative anion as the second product of the dissociation. Now that we've written that equation, again, compare it with the initial equilibrium we described for the weak acid HA. Recognize between these two equations, the common ion between the two is the anion A negative. And we can apply the same logic we did before to describe the shift in equilibrium. Upon the addition of the salt NaA, the concentration of A negative increases in solution. That increase in concentration should therefore cause an increase in the rate of the reverse reaction as the A-negative ion collides more frequently with hydrogen cations. And as such, the increase in that concentration of A-negative would lead to a shift in equilibrium to the left for the weak acid's dissociation. 
So in essence, we kind of see the main idea behind the common ion effect here. Um, the addition of an ion which is present in that equilibrium will then cause a shift in equilibrium according to Le Chatelier's principle. And as it turns out, this actually has some very important real-world applications, particularly um, in terms of things like solubility of some different substances. In particular, let's talk about the solubility of maybe like, say, a hydroxide solute. Um, were I to write an equation for the dissociation of the compound, let's say, copper 2 hydroxide, that copper 2 hydroxide will dissociate into Cu2 positive ions and A negative anions. And we can consider what's going to be the effect of the common ions uh, effect here. Were I to add another species to the solution which contained one of those ions present um, from the dissociation of that solute. In particular, let's say that I were to add hydroxide ions to my system. Upon the addition of hydroxide ions, that copper 2 ion would therefore collide more frequently with hydroxides in solution, causing a shift in equilibrium to the left, and therefore I'd expect to see a greater favorability of the formation of the precipitate CuOH2 in our system. But consider the alternate effect. What if I were to remove hydroxide ions from the system by, say, adding an acid to your system? If you were to add an acid to the system, the equilibrium that governs the acid's behavior, like let's say I add hydrochloric acid, um, would essentially be related to another equilibrium that we're familiar with, which is the autoionization of water. Um, I can write an equation here describing water's autoionization in which the hydrogen is transferred from one water molecule to another, producing hydronium ions and hydroxide ions. And if I now consider water's ionization equation, notice that there is a common ion between that equilibrium and between the equilibrium described by the dissociation of the copper 2 hydroxide. And as such, if I were to add an acid to my system, you'll notice that the effect of adding an acid to the system on the hydroxide concentration from water's autoionization equation would be a decrease in hydroxide concentration as more water is produced due to that shift to the left. And if, again, we were to decrease the hydroxide concentration, we can now look to the common ion effect on the other equilibrium present here. A decrease in hydroxide's concentration means those hydroxide ions will collide less frequently with copper two ions in solution. And as a result, we would expect to see a decreasing rate of reverse reaction for this equilibrium. And therefore, we'd see a shift in the equilibrium to the right, implying that copper 2 hydroxide precipitate would be more likely to dissolve and dissociate into solution upon the addition of an acid to the system. And this should be a pretty familiar idea to you if you think back to maybe some observations you might have made about other um, substances which might form, say, residue around the outside of maybe a faucet or something. If you've ever observed that little ring of residue that forms around the outside of a faucet, you might recognize that an effective way of cleaning it and getting that residue to dissolve might be to add a cleaning agent which might be fairly acidic. And the key idea there is that a lot of those um, ions involved in forming those precipitates that form as that residue might have a common ion effect uh, which might be affected by the actual acidity of your solution. So this is something actually we can see some real-world chemistry um, related to the uh, concept of the common ion effect. It is also, as it turns out, fundamental to our understanding of buffer systems, which we will be examining in our next lecture. All right, so let's move on to seeing an example of this common ion effect in action. All right, we are now going to go ahead and see the common ion effect in action here in a quick demonstration. We are going to be examining a system in which we have the equilibria described by ammonia interacting with water. As that ammonia accepts a proton from water, it forms ammonium ions NH4 positive and hydroxide ions OH negative. And to this equilibrium system, we are going to uh, add some ammonium nitrate, that is NH4NO3. Now, notice here that our initial pH of our solution being measured is a pH of approximately 12.05. And now upon the addition of the solid phase ammonium nitrate, NH4NO3, you see that the recorded pH there is now dropping fairly rapidly from the original 12.05 down to 
looks like about now 11.02 or so. And we can understand this observed effect by applying our understanding of the common ion effect. Uh, upon disassociation, the ammonium nitrate solution will disassociate into ammonium ions, NH4 positive, and nitrate ions, NO3 negative. And looking at that disassociation, we see here that the ammonium ion, NH4 positive, is a common ion to both this disassociation of ammonium nitrate and also to the uh, aqueous equilibria described by ammonia's interaction with water. And as such, applying Le Chatelet's principle, an increase in the concentration of ammonium ions, NH4 positive, upon the addition of NH3, should therefore increase the rate at which ammonium ions come into contact with hydroxide ions within the solution, thereby increasing the rate of the reverse reaction for ammonia's uh, hydrolysis equilibrium. And that should have the net effect of pushing this equilibrium to the left. As we push this equilibrium left, we should see the hydroxide concentration in our solution should go down, and with a drop of hydroxide concentration, we would therefore expect a corresponding decrease in pH, which we have observed in our demonstration. So, that is uh, seeing that in action here. We'll move on to our final slide. All right, to finish up our look into the common ion effect, let's take a look at an example problem here in which we observe the effect on the pH of a system by the addition of a common ion to an equilibrium system. So the example number two here is going to ask us to determine the pH and the percent dissociation in a 0 0.10 molar solution of hydrofluoric acid HF. And after we've done so, um, we're going to then ask you to find the pH and the percent dissociation of that acid upon the addition of one mole of solid phase sodium fluoride to two liters of that solution, as long as we assume no change in volume. So as a start off here, um, we have a weak acid HF, and we know how to find the pH of weak acid by using an ice table as a tool. So let's go ahead and start by doing the things we know how to do. That is, we can write a dissociation equation describing hydrofluoric acid separating apart into solution into the component ions of H positive and F negative. And with this dissociation equation, we can go ahead and set up an ice table. Our initial given concentration of hydrofluoric acid was 1.0 molar. And we're going to assume initial concentrations of the other ions in the system here as essentially zero for the hydrogen ion and for the fluoride ion. And from this position, we can now determine the direction of equilibrium shift. Uh, we will see a shift to the right as the system establishes equilibrium and therefore changes in concentration of HF of minus X moles per liter. And for the dissociated ions, H positive and F negative, we will both see plus Xs for their changes in concentration. And therefore, in equilibrium, we would end up with equilibrium concentrations of 1.0 minus X moles per liter for HF, and then X moles per liter for both H positive and F negative. So here is our ice table. We can now proceed by setting up our K expression. The Ka for this acid would be, as always, products over reactants. That would be concentration of H positive times the concentration of F negative, all divided by the concentration of the molecular acid HF. And as we've seen before, we can solve this ice table by plugging in the equilibrium concentrations defined in terms of x into that k expression and using the ka value, which we can look up out of your textbook. I find the value of ka of hydrofluoric acid to be 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4. And that ka would therefore be equal to those products would both have concentrations of x at equilibrium, so that is x squared in my numerator divided by the concentration of hydrofluoric acid at equilibrium, which we see again was 1 minus x. And here we have something that looks like it's going to determine, be determined by a nasty quadratic equation, which means we're going to simplify our math by our assumption method, in which we recognize for a weak acid like HF, it might be safe to assume that the value of x will be a very small value in comparison to that initial molarity of 1.0 molar. By making this assumption, I now can rewrite my expression for the Ka expression here of 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4 would now be equal to x squared divided by 1 minus a tiny, tiny number, which essentially is equal to 1.0. And solving for x here is very simple. All I need to do is take the square root of both sides, and I get here an x value of 0 0.027 molar. All right, so we have an x value 
Before we move forward, let's prove to ourselves that the assumption we made was valid and did not introduce an undue amount of error into our calculation. To check our assumption, we again will divide the x value we determined by the value we assumed it was small in comparison to. So 0 0.027 molar divided by the initial molarity of 1 molar times 100 to express that as a percentage yields for me a percent error introduced into that calculation of 2.7%, which fits within our 5% rule, which we have followed uh, in this process. Also recognize that in the process of solving for that percent error introduced by that calculation, I've simultaneously determined the percent dissociation of my molecular acid. Since again, essentially that X value is the concentration of the dissociated ions, and I compare that to the concentration of the initial molecular acid, which was again one molar as a fraction of that initial sample. So we see here that 2.7% of our molecular acid dissociated into those ions. And from here, I can just do cleanup in terms of a pH calculation. The pH, by definition, is the minus log of the concentration of hydrogen ion. Because my x value from the ice table was the concentration of that hydrogen ion, I can simply take the negative log of 0 0.027, and this yields for me a calculated pH of this weak acid of 1.57. All right, so ice table solved, and we found the percent dissociation and the pH of that solution. Let's now move on to the more complicated part of this thinking, which is what's going to happen upon the addition of 1.0 mole of solid phase sodium fluoride to 2 liters of that solution. Now, first off, recognize, let's think qualitatively before we do any math. The sodium fluoride is a soluble salt, which should dissociate into sodium ions and fluoride ions. And as it undergoes that disassociation, it will completely separate apart, meaning we are going to end up forming fluoride ions in our solution, which are a common ion to the equilibrium described by the dissociation of the hydrofluoric acid. So my prediction is the net effect of this should be an increase in the concentration of fluoride ion, causing a shift in the acid dissociation's equilibrium to the left, and therefore my expectation is that less of the acid will dissociate into ions, and as such, I will have a smaller percent dissociation upon my calculation. Likewise, an equilibrium shift to the left should cause a decrease in concentration of hydrogen ions, and we would therefore expect to see a higher pH in our system. So there's some qualitative thinking. Let's now do the math to prove it. Uh, first off here, as I add that sodium fluoride to 2 liters of my solution, I want to go ahead and find the concentration of the dissolved fluoride ion in that solution. Uh, one mole of NaF per two liters yields a molarity of NaF of 0 0.50 molar. And again, because the NaF dissociates in a one-to-one -one ratio into fluoride ions, we would then expect to see 0 0.50 molar fluoride ion in our solution as well. I'm now going to go ahead and set up my ice table, again looking at the equilibrium describing hydrofluoric acid's dissociation. Um, again, so HF dissociates into H positive and F negative ions. And in setting up this ice table, again, I'm going to have the same 1.0 molar solution of HF that I started with under my initial conditions, the same zero in concentration for the uh, H positive ion. But now I'm going to include as the fluoride ion's initial concentration, a concentration of 0 0.50 molar due to the dissociation of that sodium fluoride. And from here, I can now describe my changes in equilibrium, minus X for the reactant HF, and again, plus X for both H positive and F negative yielding equilibrium concentrations of 1.0 minus x for HF, x for H positive, and 0 0.50 plus x for F negative. So I've got an ice table. We'll now use our K expression in order to solve it. The Ka of the acid, as we saw before, is the concentration of H positive times F negative over the concentration of HF. And I can plug in again the values from my ice table. The concentration of H positive was X at equilibrium. F negative is now 0 0.50 plus X. And we'll divide that by my denominator of HF's concentration at equilibrium, which we determined to be 1.0 minus X. That ratio is again equal to the Ka of hydrofluoric acid, which was again 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4. And yet again, we'll use our assumption method to solve here uh, to keep from having to solve nasty quadratic. By assuming in this instance that X is a very small concentration in comparison to the initial molarity, this time of 0 0.50,
because again, 0 0.50 was the smaller of my initial concentrations. My K expression will simplify down now to 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4 is equal to X times 0 0.50 plus a very, very small number, which is essentially equal to 0 0.50, all divided by 1.0 minus a tiny number, which essentially is equal to 1. And this is very easy at this point now. All I have to do is divide both sides by 0.5 to solve for x. And I solve here to get an x value of 0.0014 molar. All right, now having done this, let's now take a look here and calculate our percent dissociation. And be careful here because remember, percent dissociation really represents the fraction of the molecular acid that has separated apart into the component ions. So even though I made the assumption here that x was very small compared to 0.50 molar, which I could really prove again by dividing that x value of 0.0014 by 0.5, multiplying by 100 to get 0.28% error introduced, in this instance, my percent dissociation would be the x value of 0.0014 divided by the concentration of that initial acid, which in this case was 1.0 molar. And then again, multiplying that by 100 to express it as a percentage in which case I get a 0.14% dissociation. So we've got our percent dissociation, and we can now clean this up by finding our pH of the solution, uh, because again, the x value still is the concentration of hydrogen ion. A pH is the negative log of that x value, which would be the negative log of 0.0014, and plugging that into a calculator yields a pH of 2.84. So let's now make a comparison in terms of the pH of the initial solution and the percent ionization versus the solution upon the addition of the common ion. Um, in terms of percent dissociation or percent ionization, uh, you'll see here that the acid is much more dissociated in the pure solution of hydrofluoric acid. Um, it, it was, again, 2.7% dissociated there, whereas the common ion there had the net effect of dropping that percent dissociation to to 0.14%, which essentially is 20 times lower in percent dissociation. And that again makes logical sense because of our qualitative understanding there that the addition of the F negative ion should have caused a shift in equilibrium to the left, meaning that acid would be less likely to dissociate and the formation of the molecular acid is more favorable within that solution if the common ion is present. Likewise, that same shift in equilibrium to the left that we described would have a net effect of decreasing the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution as they are consumed more effectively by those F negative ions. And again, that decrease in concentration of hydrogen ion would lead us to believe that there would be an increase in pH due to the addition of the ion F negative. And we see that as our pH increased from 1.57 in the HF solution to 2.84 in the solution which contained the sodium fluoride added as a common ion. So, we can now see here that the math which we already had available to us from our equilibrium chemistry can now be used to apply to a system in which a common ion is present um, as long as we pay attention to the net effect on the equilibrium of that system um, within our ice tables. And that's pretty much how these problems will work. We will see more of this common ion effect in several other locations later on in our year, in particular when we get to buffer systems in our next lecture, and later on when we deal with some solubility chemistry as well. That's it for this lecture. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.